Good morning and welcome to our combined council day today. We will be covering three different committees. We are trying to catch up. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Councillor Foster to share karakia or thoughts with us. Yes, I'll definitely share some thoughts with us. Thank you so much. All right. Please, can there be no more intense rain? We're over it. <laughs> we don't need any more, thank you. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity, actually, to um, give a big shout out to Ben Green and our civil defence team, a mammoth effort, and it's still ongoing. And also a big mihi to our Mayor, Rihet, who has hosted ministers, visited affected communities, and fronted media with style, grace, and awesome professionalism. A big mihi to our CE, Nadine, who has kept us very well informed with daily updates and coordinated the massive emergencies with true leadership. She and her dedicated GDC staff have proven once again how committed they are to the well-being of our community. Also, the incredible amount of staff and community volunteering has been inspirational. The Gisborne District, the Gisborne District Council has a huge heart with much other heart, and I am so proud to be part of it like I'm sure everyone else is. Thank you for your words, Larry. And as you said, this is a true community effort and our community has been absolutely outstanding. Without further ado, I move the apology for Councillor Rob Telfer and lateness for Councillor Rawania Parata, who will be here soon, seconded by Councillor Farehinger. All in favour. And Councillor Telfer is attending rural and provincial on my behalf, so he's a leave of absence. Uh, those meetings were planned long in advance, but we moved these meetings, and he's my rep on rural and provincial, so that is why he is not here today. Councillors, I ask we're on agenda finance and performance decision making items. I please ask that you move to page four, which is our minutes. And that is our meeting on the 7th of December. So these minutes will be emailed out by Annie as she now does. So everyone have the opportunity to take a look and feedback before we then come back. But if there's anything in these minutes, you Moved by Councillor Cranston, seconded by Councillor Gregory. Just no more questions or queries. Do you have a the right thing from the minute? Well, what do you want to discuss? Because that would be in the action sheet. Um, it might not be in the action sheet. So please. Okay. Um, matters arising, page eight, and the white fire flood control scheme. Um, I presume that river levels on the white core and the TRI have been taken at peak flood in critical areas. And these results be used in a Tonkin and Taylor, which we've all read that report on the East Coast floods, and a Tonkin and Taylor type report, not to the same extent, but can this report be done as quickly as possible so that the remaining $2 million uh, approximate amount yet to spend on the white power and TRI can be reallocated, perhaps more, um, more prioritised, so that on these rivers we can get maximum protection of life, houses, farms and infrastructure. Thank you for that. Thank you, um, through your worship. Um, the purpose of the minutes was to reflect on the activity um, and that period that happened in that particular quarter. It's not the place to raise uh, any requests by way of any future river modelling or um, investigations that we will do as a result of Cyclone Gabrielle. That's the matter for another potentially in operations, and I'm not sure if we've got anything on the committee, but that's another. That's actually a subject of another paper that would need to come back to the committee. Thank you. Can you give us an assurance that then... Just point of order. <laughs> point of order. What we're doing now is passing minutes as a true record of what happened at that meeting. What the, the CEO just said is there's another time and place for this. Moved by Councillor Cranston, seconded by Councillor Gregory. All in favour? Contrary? Uh, yeah, it was one small correction. Uh, yes. I've stopped using Rodi as my first name. Um, What's that? Um, what page? Rony, Rony Robinson. Rony. Yeah, I'm not going by Rony. It's too close to Thank Crony. You. 
Thank you. Okay, councillors, we move to our action sheet. Thank you. That is on page 12. Thank you. Okay. We move to page 13 of 108 financial impact of roading emergency work. Dave, I welcome you to the meeting. Please feel free to take a seat here next to me. And then what we will do is give you a few minutes to just open the floor and then I can ask councillors if there are any questions or queries. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Kia ora. The, um, the report um, excludes the cost of Hale and Gabriel. Yeah. Gabriel is certainly the East Coast quite, quite significant, and we have the compound effect of Gabriel. So these costs are included in there. So today, to the end of January, we've spent 16.7 million on emergency work today. And that, as I say, that ex excludes Gabriel and Hale. So there is going to be a significant overspend coming to this financial year. And that's, though I hate being a bit of bad news, it's, it's something that's going to be coming out of our control. And like we were saying before, it's impacting council's overall business because it's, it's impacting our ability to loan and whatever decision is made for future decisions. Just, and I'll probably, maybe speaking out of terms, just immediately I've, I've told our roading team that roading projects are just going to be put on hold until we come back and, and consider what needs to be, um, uh, I'll bring back a revised program. So right now we've got two roading uh, intersections in the city that they've attended and whether that's the right appropriate thing to do now when communities are cut off. So legally we can do it, but whether it's the right thing to do, I'd rather come back to this committee to have a discussion. Thank you. So I'm just going to ask councillors um, if you have something to say, take your turn, and then I will make sure everyone get a turn first. I'm not saying I won't allow, allow more questions. I just want to make sure we hear all voices around the table. So councillor Robinson and then councillor Cranston. Um, thanks, Mr Hatfield. So when I read this paper, that was the first thing that sprung to mind, obviously, the more recent events. Um, so is the reality that the proposed um, use of the FAR fund or the FAR reserve in this paper is actually now being overtaken and we should not, we should in fact be having a more fuller paper brought back to us as soon as possible, um, particularly given the potential for Putia to come in from Bakakotai or even from central government um, and, and you give us a more fuller comprehensive report. Is that what you're proposing? Because that's what I feel I need. Yeah, so, so before, the, so this was before, um, Gabriel, because we it was going to be an impact, and we wanted to bring it to you early before uh, instead of getting it in June and you getting surprises for we are overspending. So that's why it was brought up. It was meant to come up in the first month of, of February. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but at this moment, we've already for the excluding Hale and Gabriel <laughs> is spent from. Um, for previous events that we need to resolve. Now, if the government comes back, that's great. We're still waiting for our bespoke application from Wokkotahi. We've asked them, and I'd like other councils as well, if we'd ask them for that. And, and that will have an impact on, on potentially what, what the numbers will stack out. Uh, um, even though they're busy, we've still asked for, you know, we need some um, decisions so I can provide you some financial uh, decision and, and that, that board is, is we can't wait till the end of June because our contract is still have to be paid and we have to make some decisions. Okay. Well, can I just um, add to that? Um, so the report that you had there was saying that these are works outstanding of which we've already done up to January, which was the 16 odd million. So I was getting approval for that. The second parts of it said in a subsequent paper, which giving gave a little bit of reference, which is in the um, extraordinary council meeting. And it just said, hey, we realize we've still got to assess what um, Cycling Hale and also Gabrielle is going to do with it. And it said, um, 
in that, um, that pot that you approve for the 25.5 will have to be, if it does, reprioritise use. We know that we will need to use it. Um, there is also an assessment from the central government where they have said initial response is 250 million. Um, what that does to our own pools, we know we're going to be needing funds um, and actually do it. So this does can stand on its own um, as we progress um, and decide how we use the pot and while we use our own reserves, we know that we need to be contributed, but that's um, how it will go through and you'll be updated as we go through, as we're getting the fundings. But essentially, it can stand on loan and it can be re- This is really about trust. closing off that. Yeah, okay. exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Councillor Cranston. Yeah, similar really, the as far the requirement of being spent in the financial year, um, Work we've got in front of us is years. Yeah. You know, so so yeah. will they reallocate that on a more practical way instead of having a requirement that is spent in the same financial year? That's um, uh, many other councils in, a, uh, in my position are asking the same thing. So when uh, I was saying that we were looking at the emergency routes procedures, I caught a few other councils in there, you know, Hawks Bay, Buller, West Bay are in exactly the same position and willing to support. Our proposal because it, it forces you to try and spend in that financial year, and sometimes you're not doing the right decision because you're trying to just fix it as quickly as spend it. Yeah. You're not putting that resilience spend that you exactly. Yeah, I think. Sorry, I sorry. made through the chair. Um, I think there's a number of moving parts here. Um, so, just in terms of this, the recent cyclone and national state of emergency. There's work underway in terms of um, a recovery, regional recovery approach, whether that goes Hawke's Bay, Tairawhiti, Tairawhiti on its own. Uh, and through that avenue, some of these um, levers that we might need to ensure that our emergency works are 100% funded or just to remove some barriers might be easier via that vehicle. So it's really mu uh, it's very much uh, where is the board at in terms of their consideration around our application, but also what might this recovery, uh, regional recovery approach as they have stood up and previous things like Christchurch earthquake and Kaikoura, what will that look like and how can we therefore use it so funded and delivered? And the, the other thing with the unfit sites, which will probably be left, about how many sites are there? It's on page 19, number 14, where you've got sites that have not been fixed. Been. Yeah, so that's... Um, in our discussions with Waka Tani, they're saying, look, they're almost saying, let's start from ground, uh, start from scratch, mm -hmm. and, and those are included, and so um, just what you at the same time. So until we get to some of the top ends, because we just haven't been physically able to talk to you, that's for lots, lots. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Councillor Farahina, Councillor Ria. Um, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, I, I, um, I fully support our recommendations. I'm really, really happy to move these. Um, the, the, the reason why I think it's really important that we move these and push these forward is because often, sometimes the response is that uh, we'll wait and try and coordinate and all of these kinds of things, but there's been a response that we've gotten out of Central for a long time, um, and from others for a long time. And we need to be trying to push these uh, these financial decisions, these emergency works decisions forward. We need to put a stake in the ground and say this is this, these are the things that we needed prior to Hale and Gabriel, and then also come back and coordinate on those things. We can't we can't defer this stuff or be convinced to defer this stuff in order to package it into something else that is a, also based around Hale and Gabriel recovery. This is the stuff that occurred over the last um, few years. Uh, this is the stuff that we need to get funding for. This is the stuff we need to allocate funds for. So I'm 100% behind supporting these recommendations. I'm happy to move your wish. Thank you for that. Councillor Ria and then Councillor Foster. Um, so, given that um, Wakatahi and other external agencies acknowledge that and recommend that we should be um, re-evaluating sort of what our, our um, necessities are at the moment, uh, is there also a possibility of some type of dispensation to extend the time to use the funds and also to reallocate the funds? Because I do agree with... Um, what Josh has said, I do want to move this forward so that we can um, 
uh, address some of our more immediate things, but also I totally agree with what you say in, in that these two things that we had planned for town, they do seem rather small things when we know that we have communities like Tupper Money Bay who are totally cut off from access and that our funds should be um, refunded into something that could really help on a, in a, in a little here sense to give access back to our people. Yeah. Councillor Foster. Oh, I'm just happy to second. Uh, Thank you. Councillor Elder. Um, so, sorry, someone has to ask some hard questions, and um, I've been out and about, and people have asked me hard questions um, out there, and um, I think they have uh, a right to some answers. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to reference again the Tonkin and Taylor report on the coast and its um, mention of preventative maintenance prior to a flood. And then I, I remember the reason, one of the reasons I stood for council was because of the state of our roads and drainage systems in our region. Everybody knows that we are, have been way behind on preventative maintenance in drainage, off-edge drainage and, and um, potholes. These can go on and cause major failures in extreme weather conditions. Just get that clear, they, they can cause major failures. So I have a question. We've been sitting, and, and, and back in the winter, we were saying, fix the roads, and, and council was saying, we have no money. And then to find out that the council has been sitting on a slush fund of 1.7 million, the question is, could that money not have been used earlier? I believe, yes, let's spend it now. Let's get some roading checks. But I have to ask that question. Why, why did we not use it earlier? Can I just, uh, before you would like, so intention um, that it's not, uh, the fire reserve was committed to use for other emergency works. Um, at the end of uh, the financial year, uh, Wakata gave us a, a slightly higher fire rate, which means we have funds left um, in there. We had used all of it and it was earmarked for the remaining parts of the emergency works as we were progressing through it. So the fact is that we got a little bit more into those funds than what we anticipated means that we now can reapply it for the remaining mm -hmm. things. There were at the point of time so there's never ever a surplus as, as we were required and as we were getting the different things we were doing the work. Yeah, and um, look, our, our asset management plan uh, strictly said that uh, we, were, we needed $164 million to catch up with, with plaintiffs. And, and so that's why there was that deferred, deferred maintenance. Some of the um, issues like um, slash, you know, some of the bridges we've got, they just couldn't cope with the amount of slash. They could cope with the water, but once you added that pressure, there's no way, and the amount of rain that fell in that period. I want a retraction of slush fund. Slush fund is a reserve of money used for illicit purposes, especially political bribery. I want a retraction. Sorry, I will retract the fact that I used the word slush fund. I apologise. Thank you. Um, a fund that was allocated for maintaining roads. Um, and I would just like to point out, again, quoting Tonkin and Taylor, that emergency work could include clearing drains prior to a known um, bad weather event. And we knew cyclones were coming last winter. We were also dealing with four other events, plus hail. Hail was significant, the cleanup of that. And so we were reopening roads, and as we were reopening roads, the roads were falling down, just like now. We just, just had a battering of weather events. This is seventh event. Seventh event, months. yeah. And and that's it. It's just, we just need to stop the rain. Councillor Pahuru Huriwai. Thank you. I think you muted, my friend. Oh, just fine. Yeah, Good day, everybody. Oh, we can't hear you, Ani. I'm speaking. Oh. Might be now. Just wait, Ani. We're trying to sort if there's something on this side. Okay. Maybe some volume or something that we need to. You can hear us well? 
It's Kim. Hello. Can you hear me? Take a look there. Stephanie was on Max. Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora. Can I try now? Try and speak, Annie. Kia ora. No? Sorry, I'm going to have to go and get IT. Okay. Can she put a call through your phone? I can hold it up. <laughs> Someone can see my Ani, thing. Ani, what I'm going to do is put you on the phone. Nice. And you answer. Just remember, people, we've been through COVID. Papa Bill has been on my phone. <laughs> Do not worry about that. So that we can just have a one of our laptops. And ringing you, Ani. Oops, you're not answering, my friend. You're not ringing. <laughs> I'll just get her up on the YouTube live stream. Oh, there she's ringing. There we go. Kia ora, my friend, you're now on speakerphone. Oh, you might have to mute your computer. No. Wait, she was using YouTube computer. Use your mic. That's weird. No. There we go. Yep. That's good. Thank you. Okay, everyone, dead quiet. You speak up, Ani. Hello, everybody from Sunny Photo Kahika for Chase. Um, I want to support Joshua's oh, second, second the recommendations and um, Josh's uh, moves. Um, I get, I'm just moving forward. The, I mean, it feels like we're behind the eight ball constantly with the with the weather events. Um, thank you, Dave, for your reporting, Colleen. Um, I really I don't know how we get on the front foot of all of these weather events, but it seems like we're even looking through all the, the, the reports, we're, we're way behind. And I just hope going forward, the community solutions, the community has been telling us that they have, they've got solutions to the problem um, and that we engage them throughout the tight apathy, um, that the focus is not solely on, or is not heavily on Gisborne, but that it's, it's considered across whatever the regional response is, if we get a regional response package, awesome, but that's for the whole of the tight apathy. Um, over the last couple of days since the events that have happened in town, there's been not very much mention of the rest of the case at all. Um, so, yeah, that's just my title at this stage. If we can please make sure that anything going forward that our communities who have solutions are listened to, and um and actively engaged in anything going forward. Kira. Thank you for that. I'm gonna hang up. Oh she hung up on me. <laughs> Here we go. So Ria, on that point about community solutions, how might community solutions be feedback to us? To they get feedback hundred at hundred per day. But, but in a but in a way that make any sort of difference if they've got potential solutions. Is this in terms of voting or well, just? I, I guess what Annie just said about some community solutions. General order, this sounds like holistic solutions. Um, so just in terms of recovery, we're working on a plan, what that might look like, um, and that'll very much be community driven, communities, township recovery approaches. So that gets away from kind of the, there will be some city centric because there have been some fundamental impacts in the city that will be different for the coastal communities. Same with Tikaraka, there'll be, we need to approach it in a very much community driven way. There's a massive pe recovery piece happening at this stage, which is we're lucky to have our own recovery minister. Nadine and the team, the recovery team are working with iwi partners with um, the government, with everyone to make, with industry, with we have industry reps, beef and lamb, horticulture, everyone on there. So there's a massive region-wide approach to this recovery, which will take years. And also our teams making sure the assistance that are available for farmers or horticulture, the assistance that are available to our small businesses and our bigger businesses, um, everyone's aware of what's available and it's made easy for them to access that government money. Thank you. Okay, so if I don't see any other questions, we've got a move. Oh, Councillor Tom, thank um, you. 
Yeah, just with that, I'm happy to pull a 1.7 FAR reserve because that, that's money allocated to roading. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a bonus. But yeah, I'm not, not too sure on the 700K loan. It's pretty much, oh, I see that as spending money that we don't actually have. And I, I think we indicate to the government that you don't have this money. You need this money from something. I, I don't sort of feel it's right. Borrowing money and putting us more under, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that 1.7 definitely, it, it, it's a bonus and allocated it's eroding, but yeah, putting us more and more in debt. I think we should be indicating we need more money, we have got this money, instead of spending money we haven't, haven't actually got. Well, I agree, agree Worship, that, that is part of what we're trying to achieve with our request for 100% emergency funding from Waka Kotahi. Um, and as um, Mr Hadfield pointed out, when we developed the long-term plan, um, to be able to just keep on top of everything, we needed an extra $161.7 million above the current funding levels. So already we're short and we simply don't have 700 k that we can throw at it from the roading area. Otherwise, we're further behind in terms of any other maintenance that's required. We just don't have the 700,000 line. So, so that 700k we're spending yeah, needs to come off some other budgets within council that's already been allocated. That would have to come off the roading budget because that's from where it's appropriated from as per our finance, um, revenue and finance policy. That's all coming to mind. Okay. Right of reply. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Roger, just to um, just to expand on the to give a full full answer in regards to the loans of um, the loan of a seven hundred k. Would that be linked to some of the information that was in our treasury report? Because that has our how much we're able to uh, uh, get fund that, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So would it be fair to say that that's that there's possibly an answer to my there? Um, it's fair to say that we have the ability to borrow. Yeah. Um, and it's fair to say to unlock 87% um, from um, central government, and we only contribute 13%, um, it is actually a well use of the, the funds that are available to do more work. Otherwise, um, it's not just 700K, you're actually unlocking about 5 million. Um, so it, it is, um, and, and the way that we're saying it is, to use those funds, which we have with regards to debt, um, it is over the period of time and is probably the most uh, ease um, that we can actually do. And if we've got an advantage, there's a mechanism that um, is recommended um, to do. Overall, you can decide um, at a later stage if there are prioritizations um, within the long term plan of what your debt levels and things are, but um, you're unlocking a significant amount of money from what we tell you by doing that. Very much. Okay, councillors, I have a let me just check because I am checking. Can I please? So, excuse me if I'm on my phone, but I'm also communicating with councillor Pahuruhuruwai. Can I please ask how long it will take for the Waka Putai money to land, given how slow they've been in the past? Our teams need the money right now. We're on to them, Ani. We are, but we don't have a clear answer yet. There's a lot of discussions happening um, with them and you. Yeah. Okay, I've got a mover in Councillor Farehinga and a seconder in Councillor Foster. If there are no more questions or queries, all in favour, aye. On three, carry. Thank you for that, Dave. And also, thanks. please convey to your teams who've been working 24 7. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Okay, councillors, we move to page 41, which is a 
draft annual plan. Pauline, I'm going to ask you to open the floor for us and then we'll have questions. So I'm just going to um, actually give a presentation because I, I'm totally aware that that paper before you was very complicated. There's a lot of nuances, there's a lot of things that are making up with it. Um, also, the basis of that, most of it was uh, in January. Um, completed um, and there are other impacts that can come from it. So this is just to give you um, main points of the report that I'm just going to go through um, and then obviously after that I'll open it up to any questions that you can have. Um, so this is just the sort of the things we're going through, uh, talking about the support and recovery mechanisms that we will have in place now. We talk about the annual plan process, uh, the main changes that is um, uh, spoken about within the draft annual plan, uh, what we said in the LTP, uh, mentions of DIA, which is around the free water reforms and intended decisions. Um, and then there's a little bit of a brief cap, um, actually what's happening out there nationally. So in terms of this, um, we have, uh, like we did in um, COVID, uh, we have immediately got um, the penalty remissions that any, if it was overdue rates due on the 20th of February um, was pressed or um, we've taken in and given a remission with it. So anything that they have, uh, that they are due to late, it will be immediately remitted off. Um, in place is also red or yellow stickered um, houses uh, for the remaining uh, rates um, towards instalments, three and four towards the end of the years has um, been remission off as well. Uh, we have a remissions available um, and we'll be actively working with people if they have got impacts just to say if your property has been severely eroded or impacted um, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, we'll assess that with remissions. Uh, there is the same as like in COVID, if there were uh, options to uh, propose postpone rates up to six months, we've, but there is a, a, an interest rate applied to it, but our minimal um, council interest rate that's applied to it. What we found in COVID, uh, if we worked with uh, payment plans with people, people didn't actually take that up, but it is available. The Disaster Relief Trust um, is at, currently has uh, 860 uh, case of donations. Um, and in the Mayor Relief Fund, there is a million dollars. Um, central government have given, uh, released a number of uh, packages that they um, announced, I think on the 28th, that there will be $15 million for Nauru communities. Uh, 25 million for, this is the whole, uh, so we're, we're talking um, the pot across all, this is the initial response to, uh, 25 million for farmer and grower recovery for the MPI, um, and then there's another um, 11 million for community sport for the NSC. Um, just going through, just saying, um, and I'm going to reiterate back to uh, Three years ago, um, same time, we had COVID. Um, and we were going through significant uncertainty. We had six weeks of lockdown. We did not know what that would bring and what that would mean to our community. We knew some members, uh, some <laughs> people in, within our community would be impacted more than others. Um, so the approach taken was look at the individuals and that assessment and fight on an individual basis. And rather than a blanket reduction, um, we actually said let's assess it on um, and apply the remission. That's the process, and this is the same sort of things that we put it into immediately uh, with this um, event, with these events. So the annual plan process. Um, uh, just to reiterate that um, in year two and year three, we have to we, we set the long term plan. Um, and for the first three years, the first year of the plan, um, if you like, is an annual plan. But then at the end of that year, when we start to do the annual report, 
um, we start the new process and say, okay, what is uh, the next year? Is year two still applicable? We need to actually do another annual plans just to see what's different. And we're at that process now where we're looking at the year three and saying, okay, we said that there, what has changed at that point? Um, we must uh, adopt an annual plan and that is, uh, it also set rates, but the consultation um, is only considered if it's significant or material difference from the content of the long-term plan. <coughs> this was the long-term plan um, uh, in terms of that, what we were forecasting in terms of debt. Uh, as you can see, about year three was around 142 million, that, that's the blue bar. Um, the upper, the the other second line bar is our what we call our financial strategy, our um, debt limit, which says 130% of revenue. That debt um, is to be within those bounds. And then the upper yellow um, line is what we actually can borrow from um, LGFA, and that's 175%. So that's just showing you sort of the things. But this is what we said and what we had. And so we have to go back to that LTP year three, what did we say and what do we suggest, what, what's happened, what are we gonna be doing in, in an annual plan? Similarly, uh, this is what the long-term plan um, stated, uh, that the first three years was always very, very um, uh, higher than the others. And the financial strategy, which we set um, a cap, it says 6.5% for the first three years, it, should, it has to be within that, um, plus any growth in the rating base. That means is there more um, sections or things that are added on that wasn't there before. So that's the growth basis. That growth basis for in 2024, we're walking at 0.57. So it's a, a little bit of a, um, and then the long-term plan, it assumed it was 0.5. So, um, in terms of what we've assessed for this um, annual plan, we're saying that actually um, we don't have to do the consultative procedures. We've, we've assessed it as, as that because an overall um, within our financial strategy um, parameters within um, less than 2% change and our overall debts increases within the cap of 6.5. There's no changes to the level of service, services and the outcomes are consistent with the LTP. Um, and that just summarises uh, what we've said before. What did we have in the LTP for overall rates increases? What was assumed for growth? If you can uh, see 0.5, now we're at 0.57. Um, and there um, is in terms of what, what are the percentages when we talk about less than 130% of revenue, where are we? So it's just confirming that they are within those parameters. Um, but what were the main changes? Um, the main changes uh, with financing cost um, is up uh, 1%, and we know that the interest costs uh, have risen. Um, that considered a 1.3 million additional costs um, that what we had in, um, the, from over what we had in year three. Depreciation cross, uh, cost was also um, ro uh, rose quite significantly, um, mostly within the free waters, and that was by the revalued asset occurred at the end of um, the 30th of June, 2022. And everyday costs have also increased, such like uh, the insurance. Um, so in terms of it, you've got some options that was considered within the report and the recommendations that goes with the option two, which is to be within our cap, um, which is 6.5% rates cap. And that means that we actually don't fund, we don't raise rates to cover all of the costs that's risen by the depreciation costs to the extent that it's within the free waters depreciation. And that some of our reserve funding for interest costs, we raise rates for to be, which is through about 350K, comes under the cap, but the rest of it, we look at uh, uh, using some of the reserve funds that we actually have uh, there and to allow us to go there um, to be underneath the cap. The concept which is 
throughout the paper and we reiterate it because there's a consideration of governance that you've got to uh, consider the balanced budget. Um, and it's a concept, as I say, it's reiterated uh, a number of times. Um, what we're bound by under the Local Government Act, a number of suite of um, financial uh, rules and regulations, et cetera, um, that's uh, within, as shown up there in the part of the um, section. Um, but the, the one, the main ones is uh, section 101, which says financial management, and that means manage prudently, um, that promotes the current and the future interests of the community. Uh, the section 101A is their financial strategy, and I've already sort of said what are those two main parameters with the financial strategy, a debts cap and a rates cap. Um, in section 102, the funding policies, that's the revenue and financing policy, the rules of activities, how they're funded. In section 100, the balanced budget. Now, the balanced budget is, is basically saying if you've got expenses, you should have enough money to pay for them. They, they should match one another. Um, but however, all those suite of things that's within the um, local government out, the most important one is financial prudence, the section 101. And that's with acting with careful deliberation um, and defining um, both what the current needs and the future needs. So the balance, as I said before, it's really just saying if you've got expenses, you should have your revenue, but you, this is where you consider your prudent. Um, it can be a surplus or deficit, but you must need to regard what you actually said you were going to um, do and consult with in the long term plan, uh, managing the assets of the life, uh, the policies, and basically um, today's generation and future generations. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and in terms of it, in the paper said, what are we considering? Um, the long-term plan in its financial strategy said, in that first few, three years, we knew that we had... Um, Sorry for the interruption, Pauline, let's carry on. Thank you. Okay. So, in, so pro perhaps um, why the paper was a little bit um, complicated is because we had to explain... Um, what we were doing and how we were doing and how would we have changed that um, decisions had we, we been operating the three quarters post 1st of July 2024. And the decisions is basically say, no, um, it holds, regardless of whether um, we were operating three quarters or not. And so in terms of that, there was a lot of information to go back to the backgrounds of what we did, how we did it within the long-term plan, and how do we fund it. So um, we have uh, re references that to any significant changes affect three waters, which is um, saying uh, with regards to not funding all of our depreciation, um, with not raising... Um, rates to cover the full cost of interest costs for the waste and treatment is an attended decision, um, et cetera. So we have, I have been in conversations and, and notified DIA of this, and um, they have come back uh, with it, and they agree that the depreciation, like a lot of the other councils are doing, is exactly the same thing. So they believe that some of the, the costs um, arising from the higher revaluation may or may not be realised in the future. And so it's not, um, it's not, wouldn't be prudent to raise rates when you're actually uh, not um, sure of what those full costs would be. The second part with the interest, um, the only part that they had stated that are we doing it differently than what we find rates for any of the other activities? A, um, so therefore, for argument's sake, 2% for the free water rates, but everybody else has got six or seven, meaning we're loading it on to maybe the uh, water entity um, and, and the benefit of that. And I can confirm it is not. Um, it is entirely a pr the same and consistent across all of those things. So the, the worst case scenario would be uh, what we have said that in the reserves, would they pay that out? And um, the intentions are the same, that it is consistent with what we have done. Um, so this is just a little bit of 
actually, what is our wider context? Um, and what is a face, and you, you, you probably all are aware of it, it's just a, a part to actually just to uh, re-emphasize it. And this was just um, from the ANZ markets um, that they have recently. Um, probably the most interesting one is the labor market. Um, as they put down below, where it says car um, Australia is currently sitting near at 500k job vacancies, um, and the owner, uh, Kiwi Woods Kingly, um, which and, the, and also net migration of 125,000, um, and so it shows that it's tight that their inflation is um, significant and really um, it's not moving um, down. Um, so these are some of the headlines, and this is trying to say what actually is going on nationally. Some of it, um, and what are what some of the things with it? Um, certainly, with some of the big accounts, et cetera, um, they felt this last year. So they were signalling this in their second year of the annual plan. So where we're starting to see some of the onflow is now in our third year. Um, and uh, that's the significant cost that they were saying. Accelerate rates rise up to 12%. Um, and, and again, aims were 7%, but they're actually saying originally that, that maybe a new, new norm going forward um, with it. The headlines are saying that it's not just rates, they actually need to look at everything that we actually have and how they do it. And they was looking at revenue and um, uh, financing, what were the costs that they have and what are they needed to do in some of the reviews. Um, that was occurring. Uh, Christchurch, similarly, um, and they are signaling um, they're actually having a 14 to 15% increase, but they're trying to reduce that down to a 9 to a 9.5. And basically, inflation, interest rates, and supply issues are the factors that's causing these increases. <laughs> Uh, Hamilton, um, that was year two of theirs, um, and uh, what they were saying that their increase costs, um, they didn't, didn't want to increase all of it through rates, and they needed to increase some of it from debt. Um, that means they're not going to balance their books, and it will take them to about 26, 27 um, to get back. Wow. Uh, again, Wellington City Council. Uh, Wellington City Council, this is the one that giving reference to the DIA and how they did their same similar process um, with theirs. This was the, the revaluation of their water assets put them up significantly um, in the capital program um, and the depreciation expense. So their resolution was only to fund the depreciation to the extent that they need to do renewals. Uh, with it, um, and they had they sought again DIA, and then they basically formally agreed the approach by uh, resolving to financially prudently have regards to the requirements. So they needs to be in the resolution. Incidents of rates. Um, in terms of the incidents of rates, um, that it won't be uniformly felt. It's depending on what kind of services. If you're articulated to the uh, infrastructure, um, wastewater, water supply, it would be different to then if you're out in the city, out in the rural areas where you don't have those things. Um, and it depends on your capital values. And some um, some areas where they've been self-generated, when we talk about self-generated, uh, they've done more, completed more capital improvements or there's other, other factors in play that uh, increase the value of the property. Um, so I'm just going to, the, the, some of the things I'm only going to probably give mention to um, the, the residential and saying, well, what does that mean in terms of um, rates impacts across the districts is an average of about 167 per annum or a 6.1. The city will be about $175 per annum extra um, and for the rural is about $82 to $97. Um, and I just want to bring in a, a little bit of a matrix when we was look, looking at that and going back in that same time period, what actually was the petrol increases. 
um, and um, what did that mean? Um, and on average, it's around $300 per annum for increases. So that's just the very high level um, of what that is. There will be some other things as we go through and what are the changes, but that's um, kind of the, the overall impacts. Um, telling you that inflation does have a significant event, but um, uh, costs in terms of the way we do business, but we're trying to hold everything to what we actually said within those caps. Happy to take any questions um, arising from that. <coughs> So just in summary, 3.6% loan in terms of additional costs this year were a result of external factors being, being um, inflation, uh, revaluation and their attributed um, interest costs with their interpreciation. Um, what we've presented remains within the 6.5% cap that's been placed in your financial strategy um, and applied options of smoothing um, the rates incidents, increasing our debt, phasing funding and using special reserves along with rating. Thank you for that. Questions are open. Councillor Cranston, thank you. Thanks, um, you spoke widely about the depreciation of is our next big depreciation coming up is probably the pool. Mm. Um, but I see where the asset has been fully granted, it can be um, not funded depreciation, but we're funding about 10% of it. Do we depreciate 10% or can we not depreciate? We can, and, and that's a good, question um, and as part of that uh, the long-term plan um, strategy you could decide well how much are we going to fund and how we're going to phase it but in the last one we said we will step back phasing over time so that uh, when the pool got to the end of its useful life um, we at least had the funds for um, replacing it as opposed to the current situation where we didn't have enough funds to it. So we were moving towards that, but what that level of funding, that debt depreciation, uh, we can come back to and how we will achieve it if we have pressures on us um, to do that over a, long, a slightly longer period of time. So the long-term plan by the end of 2031 said that the depreciation for the poll would have been funded. Um, so that allows us a lever to actually say, maybe we're going to push that out because we have um, things that are a bit tighter as we're facing in the next three years. Thank you. Councillor Alder. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> talking to the preferences, really, and if I, if I could push my preferences for option two, three on page. Um, and that is to not increase rates at all. Um, I leave them as they are. And now my reasonings are, um, in a family situation, when you have a budget crisis or hit a tough time and you have money allocated in various areas, the new TV money very quickly gets allocated to new tyres on the car because that's your priority. And in this situation, we have a lot of budgets and we don't like moving money from one to, to another. But I think now's the time when we seriously need to look at our new colour TVs and do we really need them? I'll push for two, three. Our society out there is facing unprecedented prices, uncertainty in employment, in particular forestry and horticulture. There are many farmers out there that are directly hit and indirectly hit because they can't pick their crops through lack of water. And I think to come in with a high rate is just going to add more pressure to our society. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Um, page 53. Um, sorry, not page yeah, 53. Table two. Um, sets out the shortfall there of 6.4 million of capital projects. The, the second line on that table talks about to improve level of service and there's an increase of over 5 million, 5.2 million or shortfall of 5.2 million. Um, I thought when we debated setting the rates uh, the last term, 
that really we spoke around actually cutting back services and, or, or keeping services on a par, not, not improving services. So can you just clarify for me, is that, a, is that just a poor choice of language or I thought we were maintaining services and services we were going to pay with a 6.5% increase in rates, not that we were looking to improve level of services and therefore cost a further. Um, for the chair, just a, a couple of things. Um, the the wheelie bins um, is 100% uh, external funding. That's a new, that's considered because we didn't have that as a level of service, so that would be considered an increased level of service. Um, in terms of the other parts that are in there, there's also what we call development contributions or anything that may uh, work uh, that is considered to uh, an increase or um, uh, new, which is when the Tarahira is the development contributions and things around there, you have to take the percentages and it might be only 5%. And so the cumulative effect, most of it being the wheelie bins, some of the time you know the TGF, freshwater improvement funding and um, which is external grant funding that are contributing um, to those overall uh, categorization of um, increased level of service. So for others to uh, I'll just reiterate, what does that mean? What are we talking about there? When you're talking about to replace existing assets, it's like, um, it's renewed, we call that renewals. So you've got a, you're updating, resurfacing the road it's renewals. That's your existing assets, we're doing those. Uh, to um, meet additional demand, you could be saying for argument's sake that the pipe diameter is increased because at the end of that, there's more houses. So that's usually driven by development contributions or that you've got increases there, so you need to do that. So that's a small pension. Um, and to improve the level of service, the big ones that we've had the improved level of service um, over a little while um, was the wastewater treatment plant phase two. Um, and some of that's growth, but some of that is also improved level of service of what we had before. Uh, obviously, the Kiwa Pools um, has been in there um, as well. So that's when you're talking about, you didn't have that, but this is what we have. And most of those things, as you say, are driven um, by external uh, grant funding. Right. And the other thing I'd like to just secondary would be just to clarify, um, and this is in response to Councillor Alder's question. The 6.5% rates increase uh, was set in the long-term plan on the basis of capital expenditure, which we committed to with the waste uh, secondary stage and the waste. Uh, um, it's not a case, is it, that we can just not spend that money or not rate for that money because we've committed to those projects and they are well and truly tens of millions of dollars of capital expenditure down the path. So Robinson is exactly right. Thank you. Um, most of the work and the operating costs is the wastewater treatment plant comes on fully operating, which is about another two million. So that is the cost you've committed to um, be able to achieve the full. Thank you. Councillor Foster, thank you. Yeah, um, just uh, page 47 with the um, three waters buckle. Um, and uh, there it is. Knowing that uh, what's happened over the last month or so with um, all the three waters infrastructure, not here but around the place, and the extra expense that's been put on it. Um, and we're funding the depreciation. I'm assuming when three waters is taken over, that depreciation will go with it. Yeah. So why do we need to fund depreciation now to keep keep up with something that we're not going to have? I know. <laughs> three, we should, yeah, because we are required to currently under our accounting standards and by legislation, we have to continue and as as status quo until uh, otherwise legislation changes. So the built-in act, so we've got the, the first act that stood up the defined the water services entities, the functions of them, the et cetera, the details is currently still in bill. And we do know that there are conversations happening around what, you know, is this, is the other entities going to stay as they are? Um, so it's still very much wait and see and let's just proceed under status quo um, and meet what requirements are in the current legislation that has been enacted as opposed to what's currently in the bill. Okay, and they're assuming that there could be funding coming through for solely free orders from what we've just gone through over the last month. 
to um, attribute to our, our um, expenses that we're going to be seeing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions or queries? Let me check my phone. People that haven't spoken yet, and then we'll get back. Let me just see if Ani is texting me. There are a lot of texts on there. No. Are we still just talking to the options, or can we talk now to the general um, whole budget? We're talking about what is in the agenda. So I just want to make it clear whatever we discuss, we only discuss what's in that certain paper. This is not an overall discussion just to float ideas. We are discussing what are our recommendations that we need to pass in order for our finance teams to proceed. So, so I've got yep. some things that I'm unsure of that are in the bucket. Right, and questions are fabulous. I'm just going to give people that haven't had opportunity yet, and then we'll come back to you. Councillor Farihinga. Thank you very much. Um, this, this paper that's in front of us is one of the uh, big reasons why we're elected on behalf of the community is to make these tough decisions. Uh, this, the, we need to do this work moving forward, and the cost of it needs to come from somewhere. Um, and that cost, the only cost, the only financial mechanism we have available to us is rates. Uh, our community have said that they want us to do the wastewater treatment plant. Our community aren't asking us to go and buy flash TVs. Our community are asking us to do the, the bare minimum and the basics. And this is what the bare minimum and the basics will cost our community. I'm, I am comfortable in moving these recommendations uh, because we have to. That's what we're, that's what we're elected to do, to scrutinise, to make sure that the colour TVs aren't in the long-term plan and that it is the bare necessities and the basics for our community. So I'm more than happy to move these recommendations. Thank you for that. I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Councillor Parata, and welcome. Lovely to see your friendly face. There's so much pain in our region. It's really hard to talk about rates at a time where we're all struggling. It's really hard to talk about three waters and water infrastructure when our rural communities don't have that. And when those things, those things won't affect us, they won't make life better for us. Um, and I agree that those things need to happen no matter what. But I do want to notice that that's the case, that these decisions will not, will not improve things for the coast and for rural communities that need it. Thank you for that. Councillor Kupara, thank you. I've been trying to hold back a little on this because I don't see we have much choice. And um, we are bound to tackle this report here in the face of some incredible devastation. And even if we didn't have the cyclone, it's still devastating to our community because we're the day after it. Um, it is stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's a terrible report in that respect. It um, tests our community's resolve, uh, particularly now when things are so tough. People are going to start losing their homes because they can't afford their mortgage. They're going to not have a capacity to pay their rates. People will become destitute and desperate. And that's the rock part of this. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any other way. And we aren't lavish here in the coast. As you said, you know, just resurfacing the roads. And we don't even have roads to resurface. 
We live a very basic life, and I think um, we need to talk to ourselves about how basic we are here on the coast <clears throat> and be very realistic about the decisions that we have to make, um, that we are fixed to having to make. I, I can see in this that we have no other direction than to loan going forward. And um, we can't continue that way. Every part of me doesn't want to support this report, but we simply have to. But post this report, we do need to have a learning with our communities. We do need to see their face and their voice more obvious in these types of reports. And I want to see the nannies and the ones who are running our poem, I want, to, I want to hear their voice when we write these sorts of things. And um, today we will make their life a little bit harder. Um, but we simply don't have the capability to make a core different from this. I can, I try to reconcile it in my mind that I've come to council as a newbie and I've inherited some of this stuff. Um, but saying that the responsibility is still the same. Those councillors that have gone before had to make those difficult decisions. Um, but we need to find a format where we can wananga around a stronger, obvious collective voice so that it doesn't just look like we sat here today and we made the decision. The Taira Fiti, this is your decision. And that need, we need to feel that, I think. It's not a criticism of your and your reporting. Um, they need to have that chance because they're the ones that have to live with that post today. Well, that's bloody depressing. <coughs> thank you, Your Worship. Councillor Ria, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I share some similar reservations in that um, in agreeing to the annual plan, and in, I'm, I totally agree that there are some things that we are legally bound to by law that we have to achieve. And, and there's no neither which way innate to be able to change that. So those are things that we have to do. Um, but in terms of the other things that are laid out in our annual plan, I'm really looking forward to our LTP, which is coming up in two weeks' time, so that we can then go back to the annual plan, because all of us sitting here know and understand that as a result of the last, especially two months, that it will greatly differ to what it currently looks like. So... Um, yeah. I just wanted to say that. Councillor Alder. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a question that's on page, uh, referring to um, page 49, number 38, and it's um, employee benefit expenses. While it is up 5 million, so it's 33 million, while it is up 5 million on the long term plan, it is in effect a transfer of costs from the consultant budget. To internal staff costs, and as a result, the employment benefit has been adjusted to reflect this. Um, so my question is, uh, why is there no negative five thousand dollars shown on the um, consultant budget portion of the budget? Thank you. Um, 
through your worship. So effectively, because we've increased um, by another 5 million in emergency fees for roads. So um, it's uh, budgeted under operating costs. It would have been budgeted under the operating costs. Employee costs have gone up, but then you've also seen another 5 million. And um, so they offset one another. So that's why you have you don't see that direct one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Okay, so this is a tough time for our community, and I do want to acknowledge everyone around the table for um, their thoughts today. They're all very valid. And I also do want to acknowledge our staff. These decisions were made as part of extensive community consultation for our previous 10-year plan. So those, those were quite some time ago. And what Councillor Ria said today, we will be starting on that journey with our community in the next while and then adopt our new 10-year plan next year. I do want to go back to what this annual plan is about, and it is basics, which we are, are working. The, the pool is money that came from the government with our contribution, a small contribution. Then it is fantastic that we can see some townships, Te Puya, Waipiru, and then our, our dear friends in Te Karaka getting an upgrade there as well, much needed. And then the next one is the real basics that we are obliged to do. It's all our regional plans. There's no option there with all government legislation expecting us to do different address climate change, which is so important and in the lens that we will put over our new work going forward for our 10 year plan, we'll have a clear, clear um, climate change lens over there looking after the environment and also very important working with our partners, Tangata Whenua and our communities. And then a big chunk of this, which will go forward will be our infrastructure, which absolutely got decimated in the last two months. I do want to make it clear to our community today, we are aware that there are hardship out there and we have several rates remissions and hardship grants available. Please contact the Gisborne District Council if you have issues paying your rates bill or if you want to talk to our friendly rating team who does it on a one-on-one -on -one Basis. So I do want to put it out there. We are here to help. We know people are hurting. We are doing our best in tough situations, but we are here to walk alongside you. So, councillors, I have a mover in Councillor Farehinga and a seconder in Councillor Foster. We're on page 43. All in favour? Three. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not your honour, but thank you for that. Okay, councillors, we are finished with this agenda. I think what we'll do is a quick cuppa, yeah. and then we'll come back with our next report. Thank you. Just the minister. So, um, I move that we go into public excluded. Wendy, we're just going to pass minutes. I move that we go into public excluded, seconded by Councillor Robinson. Uh, all in favour? Contrary, carried. Okay, I'll vacate the seat. Thank you. Councillor Cranston will chair the next. Please leave it all. We'll be back soon. Bye. All right, good morning, everyone. This is possibly, possibly the uh, smallest agenda I've seen in front of me. But yeah, it's a state of the time. As we didn't start with the karakia this morning, I will um, quickly go start with the karakia. Mata Fakapono, Mata Tuminako, Mata Ata Titaro, Mata Faka Rongo, Mata Mahitai, Mata Manawanui, Mata. Aroha, Kataya e Mato, Kataya e Tata. Right. Thank you. Apologies as this morning, Councillor Telfer. I'll move that. Thank you. Move. Second. 
I'd like Councillor Foster. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Confirmation of the credential minutes, page four. Moved by. Thank you, Moved by Councillor Foster. Second by Councillor Matters arising. I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Telfer was leave of absence rather than an apology, wasn't he? Yes, he's leave of absence. Note that. Acknowledges, mints and tributes is just our whole community. The acknowledgement and tribute of what's happening out there mm -hmm. goes without saying, I think. It's just been spectacular. No public input and petitions, no extraordinary business, notice of motions and no adjourned business. So we'll go straight to our port, which is the reissuing of the lease for the Gisborne Yacht Club at Kaiti Beach, page eight. Pretty straightforward. Very good. It is a straightforward uh, report around uh, leasing of land for the Gisborne Yacht Club, uh, renewing the existing lease uh, for seven years with two rights of renewal. Um, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that through this process, there has been a fostering of relationship with Nati Oneone, which is, um, which is uh, important and uh, uh, looking forward to potential um, collaboration of that space going forward, um, working together. Thanks, Dion. I've just had one question about the ongoing repairs, maintenance, development of the um, slip away from the boats. Will that, will that fall on us now? There's been discussion around having that as a backup for the uh, town. So. Uh, through well, you, Chair. Um, currently what is there is a hard surface access for each owner. Yep. Uh, council currently maintains that um, to a fairly basic level. Uh, and that would continue recognising that the new lease in the region no longer includes that access way mm. to the sea there. Any questions? I'm happy to move. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Farahina, seconded by Councillor Aria. Nothing for you. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. And hopefully you Noting just for your own information and that to keep up to speed with things. And that is what the noting report's about, about keeping us up to pace with what's going on. So there's no decisions around them, but still need to read them and keep up with the play. Thanks very much. Meeting closed. Awesome. Musical cheers. Here we go. They heavy around my neck today. Okay. Councillors, we will be moving into, as you can see today, we are trying to bring the reports to the fore that needs to be passed in order for us to keep business as usual going as well. We have teams working on business as usual now for the last two, three weeks, most were involved with assisting our community. But unfortunately, there's so much work that still needs to happen behind the scenes. So that is why some of the report, the noting reports are just there to read and we could re-look at our governance plan to make sure the decisions that need to be made in a timely fashion are made today. So just our extraordinary council in apologies for Councillor Rob Telfer, a uh, uh, leave of absence. I'll move that. Second by Councillor Farehenga. All in favour? Aye. On three carried. Um, any declarations of interest, acknowledgements and tributes, public input and petitions, extraordinary business, notice of motion, 
So, councillors, I'm going to take you straight to page four, and that's a supplementary report in regards to our annual plan. And Pauline and Nadine, will you open the floor for us and then we will carry this discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. So um, essentially what this report is doing, so under the financial delegations, I have a level that can allow me to spend um, for emergency work, but it does not, um, it did not kind of contemplate the degree within which spend would be required for a water supply pipe. Um, so this is asking um, that the instrument of the financial delegation is amended to um, enable me to apply funding um, for emergency water supply costs along with any external funding that comes in to be able to apply that for the purposes of our um, response and recovery efforts for Cyclone Gabrielle. And those will be reported back to Correct. us. Correct. Is there anything you wanted to add there? Okay. Essentially, yeah, that's it. It's a self-explanatory report here. Any questions or queries, now is your time. Councillor Foster. Yeah, thank you. I'm um, just um, page eight, um, 17, for a supplemented. Can I just, just elaborate a bit more on that, that particular um, sentence, please? Um, because it's, it's a little bit confused. Can, can I just have a a bit more in depth description of what, what we're meaning here. Yeah, so through your worship, private industry, so some of the um, private industries have their own water supply, so they have their own water source. And so we've been working for them to be able to supplement or increase, sorry, the Y power for the purposes of municipal water supply. They have been working with us and so have been pumping, trying to pump some of their water to our supply. That's what essentially what oh, that uh, means. Uh, pumping their water into our supply. Yes. Yeah. Well, we are working with them to put their water. Right. Okay. And so the five to six hundred K that's needed for the new treatment is for that their water to be treated before the supply. Correct. We need to yeah, we need to be able to treat their water to a standard so that it's fit for purpose for our okay. yes, Councillor Elder. Your worship. Um, two questions. One page thirty one. A 37.5 million business interruption insurance. Um, could we get a bit of an explanation on that? And then, shall I hold my second question? Okay. Okay. Where, where, where did you say that was again? Sorry? Is that uh, section 30? Paragraph 35. Sorry, page 10, question 30, uh, 31. Page 10, 31. Um, I'm just wondering. Before water's infrastructure material damage, that's what he's talking about. Uh, so that's just relating to before water's infrastructure and the 37.5 million. Um, for your worship. Um, so that was the policy. It's basically. Um, and maybe slightly the, the terms and conditions are a little, maybe a little bit um, differently than what's there yes. because of uh, um, what's available. But essentially, um, they say you've got uh, is that the upper limit is, uh, for all of those four waters um, under the scheme would be 250 million. But within that, they say we know um, that you will have to get your water supply or there's some costs associated with getting that back in there for that interruption of those services. So effectively, they say in some of that upper limits, um, you can actually apply it for um, those purposes. So that's what that means. So supplementary question, Does, could that apply to businesses our local businesses that have been affected no. by no water. No, it is only for council. Council only. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and my second question, um, page 13, the instrument of um, financial delegation. Um, three clauses there, Warrani. One, one is without limitation to an amount, and then $13 million a day, sounds rather a lot and then assigning to an acting replacement. I just wonder if we couldn't tighten up slightly on some of those figures. Um, under what circumstances would $30 million be needed to be spent in one day? Uh, free worship, this is funding. So we, if we have to pay, 
um, in terms of Lokopate, it's just money that goes out the bank. So that's that limit of what we're paying on that one day. It's not that anything else. You've approved your process that comes through in this particular, it's under the Treasury policy, is to say, okay, if you're going to arrange money, well, that's the, uh, the upper limit that, that we consider that's been paid out of our banks and those things. So if you've approved in your processes to say, um, we give you this level that's been included in the long plan. This is for roading for all of those things. But on the 20th of the month, we need to pay people. Um, and so that is all that is around. And so, yes, the 30 million uh, we could arrange. So for argument's sake, we're arranging it. And the Dean has to sign uh, today 15 and a half million for our long-term debt as it's renewed. And so you've already got 15 and a half million that may go out there. There may be other costs that we pay people of another 15 million. It, it's entirely uh, op, um, normal business as usual. Yeah. I'll, I'll, through your worship, I'll just point out too that that's already in place. So that's existing at the moment, um, which we're saying we like that and then we're adding to it. So the one that we are adding to this is that uh, there's no limitations. On, in terms of expenditure under urgent circumstances. And that, so if you refer to attachment 2358, the new insertions are 1.4.1 1. and section four. Um, yeah, I, I guess I just feel like um, in the time of emergency, the councillors feel pushed back anyway to a degree and that, and how long an emergency is gonna run for, is also slightly uncertain. Um, and to be sort of pushed back and be totally out of touch or potentially totally out of touch um, for an undisclosed amount of time is, to me, is quite a concern. I'd, I'd like to be doing the updates. It's just not for me. So, can I just say, um, through your worship, in terms of an emergency event, um, once it's declared, it lasts seven days, so there's certainty around a death. Um, that's quite clear in legislation. Uh, in this case, it's a national emergency event. And again, seven days applies unless the national controller, who Ben will now, now reports to as the group controller to NEMA, um, determines whether to extend it. So you know that if there's a state of emergency, it's seven days that that applies. Um, and, and just in terms of um, keeping in the loop of that through... Um, the mayor, who is your civil defence group chair, is closely involved along um, throughout the emergency response. And as I've said um, in my correspondence, that if there's anything further that councillors need to feel more informed about what's happening in the operations, happy to look at how I can accommodate that more. Thank you. Councillor Parata and then Councillor Robertson. Thank you. I just um, had a um, partai, some of the questions around around that. Um, not necessarily the delegation because I feel like that makes sense um, from your explanation. I'm, I'm new to this kind of setup, but that makes sense. But I was just wondering in terms of um, the way money is spent during that uh, that emergency. Um, how is that determined? That's an operation, those operational expenses or the, the CE or the controller determines what's an emergency and where that money is spent or is it largely staff costs? I just kind of want to get an understanding about. Yeah. yeah. Through, so through your worship, in terms of the um, emergency centre operations, um, essentially when the group control, when you're in a state of emergency and Ben's powers, Mr. Green's powers trigger, um, he can essentially commit council to whatever he chooses to. So, um, but he would not do that because at the end of the day when he needs to remove his grey jacket, I say you still have to eyeball us and be accountable for what you've spent. Um, but he also works really closely with NEMA. So 60% of the costs that um, are accrued through uh, civil defence emergency are um, NEMA does cover. So we also have finance that are sitting in our emergency centre making sure that what's being signed off by the controller or what's being requested by community groups as well that we have to sign off is also recoverable. Um, uh, kind of the, the case that we're thinking of that is relevant here is around when work needs to actually be done to restore a pipe, we will authorise that to get done. 
but it's best to get that done under financial delegations that have been put in place. I mean, uh, under state of emergency, the controller can do that anyway um, for tidying that up, um, having clarity around that, and also the accountability and transparency that would be reported back to um, council when and if we needed to enact those powers. Um, awesome. Can I have one more question? Yes. Um, no. Uh, I, um, I'm, I'm happy with the explanation. That explanation makes sense to me, um, and it, it seems practical. Um, I was just wondering if there is a part that either needs to be added or needs to be clarified. Kind of thought around ensuring that it's that the that the spend is fair. That. Um, Kāroha to the, the pipe that burst in town, but also Kāroha to the Hukuwai Bridge. You know, I, I just, I'm just trying to get an understanding of and within this delegation, is there a consideration for how that might be prioritised? Prioritised, yeah, prioritised for um, the needs of the township and the needs of the rural communities, Māori communities, Pacific Island communities. Like, is, there a, is there a way that, that it does that fit in this space or does it not fit in this space? Um, essentially, it's about <coughs> uh, first is around impact to life. So it, water will always, you know, take priority over a connection, unless of course that connection means that we need to remove someone from their property straight away. In which case, we'll fly them out. So um, that's how it applies in that instance. If it's a local road, so the Hikuwai Bridge, for example, that's that's NZTA. Um, so is the Mangahoani Gorge access. That's NZTA. Um, there may be instances where we consider, right, so if we need to urgently reinstate access, does council then create its own local road? And when that happens, then I start thinking, well, what's the implications in terms of my liability? What does that mean for council's liability for having a new road that's created? So then we need to think through a bit more, but it's really, these apply when it's immediate threat to life. Councillor Robinson, you and Chris. Um, page eight, um, just wanted some further clarification around the um, WIPA treatment plan. Um, Quote it all there on, on paragraph 16 and 17. What page is that, Tony? Eight. Page eight. Eight. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so we're looking to spend five to six hundred thousand dollars to assist um, access to the private halls. Is that is that cost? Um, so where, where will the benefit of that lie, like in the actual infrastructure at the end of the day? Who will own the infrastructure? Will that resort back to the private industry? Um, and also, will this additional spend enable industry to access the reticulated water supply, for example, for Sedenko and Nita Brand and Indivin? Which is a bit more of a fuller explanation about how yeah. it's going to impact on businesses. For your worship, so industry are slowly being turned back on. So we had a hui with industry last week um, and the team collated their requests. Uh, what is the minimum that they can run on? And so Judith has been compiling that and slowly and been communicating with industry how much they can use and slowly um, in order to get bare minimum going while we're also providing, you know, a base, um, support for the supply into the community. So they are slowly being taken care of. They're also through the leadership of some of the uh, big players there, like the leader brands have been um, collaborating with the other industries to see if they can share some of their water. So that's been, um, that piece has been looked after by Trust Tide Apathy facilitation and support that they need there. In terms of the um, the 500 odd K for the UV trip, that becomes our asset. Okay, and, and secondary question. So with that implemented, um, after that's been approved, is it anticipated that we'll get back to a level where the reservoirs will be filling up overnight and we will be able to sort of run as normal? Because they're supplementing the white partake and the sediment of the white partake is the, the big issue, right? Uh, we won't be back at normal until our Waingaki plant is restored. Right. So Wai Power has always been a secondary um, supply. It's never, it, it has not been built to, yeah, um, to sustain all of um, the Gisborne um, reticulated services. So, uh, yeah, it's an issue. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I also had a few questions on that number 17, page eight. Um, has that already been installed, that connection and installation, or are you looking at doing it and where we are? Does it still need to be done? Yes, they had started it. So it has already been? Yes, it's been started and I'm not sure how successful that it has been. What we do know is that we did drop um, water supply levels into Waipawa, so we've been putting, I think there were about three pumps up there yesterday trying to pull from different sources um, to get that top up back into the uh, into the Waipawa. And just supplementary, um, you, you mentioned in terms of water assets, uh, NEMA pays 60%, and hope, hopefully our insurance policy covers 40%. Mm -hmm. And when we could pay up to 1.5, does that five six hundred k and that's 150 k on TK sewage bond off that 1.5 over and above? So, for your, um, worship, uh, basically, uh, 1.5 comes off the total cost as per event. We would suggest that probably the water supply um, will be over that deductible. And so, therefore, uh, the others just add to the total cost. So, anything that we have associated with the cost, um, so long as it's included and can be claimed under those kind sort of things, uh, will just add to the overall. Um, so we would see that the maximum amount at this stage, depending on if it is accepted, is 1.5 million that we would have to pay. Okay, councillors, I take you to page five where we have our recommendations. Do I have a mover for this report? Thank you, councillor Cranston. Seconded by councillor Gregory. All in favour? Aye. Carried. Thank you. Councillor Debery. Gregory and Debbie. <laughs> okay, so councillors, you would be aware, of, you should all be aware, page 18, that we split our operations um, committee. And this is just us doing some paperwork to make sure our terms of reference and, and all of that. Yeah, that's quite straightforward. Good report. Thank you. Um, through you, you wish to get this. But the Civil Defence Emergency Management Committee's terms of reference will be amended to include the EU partners when they are yep. named. Yep. So just, just here, the, there's just a spelling mistake there. Delta. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Arnie. See if you can talk. Thank you. Kilda, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, it's actually, I, I get the sense that I'm sitting at the table with you this time and not sort of up in a, up on some wall. Um, I just wanted to pull up, it's on page 28, Power to Act, and also in a couple of other pages um, where it has to appoint non-voting tangata whenua representatives and or advisory members to assist the committee. Having been on boards where I'm a non-voting tangata whenua representative, I, I actually find that um, quite insulting because um, not to have a vote, you might as well not be there. And for a lot of tangata whenua representatives who are already engaged in multiple boards, committees, etc., and giving of their time and expertise into conversations and decision and, and not being able to be part of the actual decision making and voting. Um, I'd actually like us to really look at that. I think, don't think it bodes well in terms of um, treaty partnerships and the conversations that we are wanting to have with iwi um, if we've got non-voting tangata whenua positions at tables. I don't think that will be taken very well um or um and we would struggle to find uh membership Hilda. Hilda, thank you we're yeah, just getting a response just, ready through your worship we're just checking whether it's statutory or not because we have 
uh, in terms of the Tairawhiti Resource Management Committee looked at that as a co-governance committee where they do have um, voting rights. So I just need to clarify that. Thank please. you, Jacinta. Um, I think that wording is actually a reflection of a statutory requirement, but just to clarify the situation here is that the committee, this is a sustainable tairawhiti, will have the ability to establish subcommittees, if you look at the um, wording above that, and they could, as a part of that, appoint tangata whenua representatives to sit alongside on those committees and have voting rights in that capacity. However, what that entry there is talking about is having people to assist the committee itself, being sustainable tairawhiti, a committee of the whole. Thank you. Supplementary, just, just that the, um, it's not just in the sustainable tairawhiti committee, it's also, there's an, a number of committees, operations committee, environment and communities, um, a number of the committees, it's, they, have, they are non-voting positions and just as I said, I think we would struggle to see to to fill them, and we would. And in terms of where we're heading as a council, um, and having meaningful relationships with mana whenua, can we push back on that? Kilda. So, Kilda, um, for your worship, Councillor Pahuru, pretty why? Um, just so what um, Jacinta was saying is that that's a decision of the committee. You can choose whether they're non-voting or voting. Thank you. Thank you. I've picked up a few mistakes either, which I'll, um, I'll share with you. Um, I'll email to you, Councillor Parata. I was just wondering, just to follow on from follow on from that, could I understand that um, the committee itself can determine whether or not its Tanata Whenua uh, members are voting or non-voting and whether they're advisory um, positions. I was wondering, however, if we as, as this council can make a determination that that, that's a conversation that has to happen because if we just leave it up to each committee to decide, I, I would like to know from the table whether or not that's something that we can determine that it be discussed at each committee and it be determined as opposed to just being left. Um, yeah, I mean, through your worship, there are two things in there. The first is whether or not the committee needs a subcommittee. Yeah. So this is referring to whether you're going to set up an advisory type mm. group for particular kaupapa. So there's the first thing is whether you do that and what does that look like and whether they need to have some form of um, operations. Or the second one is whether you're going to appoint to committees of council, which was a decision that would have been made quite a while back. In that induction space around what does that look like but noted and for discussion going forward just um councillor robinson thank you so looking at um the hits of tongue to Fenua voting in the paper um there's actually a change in the language use on page 31 than it is at page 28 so for example <coughs> refers to to appoint non-voting Tangata Whenua groups and or advisories to a subcommittee, um, not subcommittee, but 31 says non-voting <laughs> advisory members and slash or Tangata Whenua representatives, which may or may not be non -voting. So from a language perspective, those two sentences do not mean the same. Thing. No, they don't. Thank you for that. I'll tidy it up. Councillor Elder. Was just a, a correction really on um, the Audit and Risk Committee, um, I believe it is Rob, Tony, Andy, and myself, not the chairs of Council Committee. Yes, I've noted that. Oh, thank yes, you. Sorry, thank you. And also just Telfer, surname was picked up and autocorrected to Telfer everywhere. Thanks for that. <laughs> Councillor Cranston, thank you. Yeah, page uh, 47 is the Appointments Committee. I'm just wondering if there's enough detail in there. Um, probably around one independent, so whether that needs to be described a bit, and appointments to other bodies, whether we are specifically <clears throat> looking at bodies or is that just general? Um, yeah, just, just there's, there's very little detail in that to actually understand that in, in its completeness. Through you, Your Worship, it sits along the board appointment and remuneration policy. 
Thank you. We could it sits alongside the board appointment and remuneration policy, which has a lot of detail in it. We could reference that in the terms of reference if you like, but otherwise we'd be repeating a whole lot of information that's already in an established place. Right, thanks. <coughs> okay, councillors, do I have a mover or a seconder? I, I can't hear, you'll have to speak up. Oh, you've moved that? Let me get to my notes because then I will know what's going on. Nadine Thatcher Swan, it's your Sorry, speaking turn. Sorry, Your Worship. Um, there is one committee that is not included in this that we will need to come back and provide to you, which is the Tata Fiti Resource Management Plan, the co governance committee um, on the plan making. So that's what's missing, and that's where the full team will be in that one. What happened to Ani? <laughs> Oh. oh, I thought you left us. All good. So a mover and <laughs> mover and councillor Farehinga, seconder councillor Parata, all in favour. Country carried. Thank you. Health and safety governance charter, page 54. Thank you, Jacinta. 54. Who is going to share a few words of wisdom? Thank you, Mr. Baiti. Yeah, to speak to this um, through the chair. Um, this fell out of your training with um, the Institute of Directors, and so staff moved quickly to bring the charter together. It is based on best practice, and we have reached out to other councils who have something similar, um, and we've worked to debate and, and tweaked it for our purposes. So um, hopefully, um, you're happy with it, um, and we'll put it in place. Thank you. Any questions or queries? Councillor Tupla and then Councillor Thompson. Just Thank thought you. in terms of um, safety, whether or not there could be a consideration to cultural safety in, in, the, in the document, um, how that particularly relates back to some of the earlier discussions in the, the fuller report around um, cultural connection and operations and rating and local leadership body, and they make reference to cultural context. And um, then that would lead into um, council taking positions on cultural respectfulness um, through its methods of communication, perhaps, um, that it was, um, there was an intention for a two-way dialogue and participation culturally. Um, and that some of the uh, particularly Māori cultural values are taken into account with regard to the environment and, and so on, um, that a, a cultural safety practice be considered in the broader context of the report. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Pahuruhuriwai, Councillor Foster, you need to remember that, because I already forgot. Uh, just on page 56, 3D, elected members properly and regularly informed and updated on matters relating to health and safety, um, just in terms of the labour shortage, um, that people who lost their jobs due to COVID, where, where, where we stand with that, have, they, have any of the of the jobs back? Does that policy still apply, given how things are moved on? Sorry, about COVID vaccination and employment. Uh, yeah, yeah, the number of staff who have yeah. the jobs due to that policy, you now that things have moved on, has that policy changed? Yeah, uh, yeah so um, some quite some time ago, the requirement for vaccination to be employed by Brisbane District Council, the decisions associated with staff that did lose their jobs as a result of the vaccination policy stood. Uh, that was national advice provided by government and employment specialists. Um, saying, in saying that, we have had some staff return in that process, um, and, but, but in terms of um, reversing those decisions, that is not a consideration, and this practice will lead to the class. So, so, so some staff have okay. come, come back? Yeah, but not, so not, not as of right, because they applied for jobs that were available. Thank you. Councillor Pahuru. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just want to thank James on, and, and the team for getting this together. Oh, I was really pleased to see the, 
this health and safety charter um, in our papers and just want to support um, Councillor Tupara's uh, recommendations around including cultural safety. Um, and I just wonder, because this has fallen out of our um, governance training, which was really great, and we spent a lot of time on our tikanga and values, whether that could be reflected somewhere in this charter as well, please. Thank you. Your Worship, sorry, that was on me. I um, We were meaning to bring back to you the um, the values that you created in the workshop, yep. so that's on our to-do list, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> some art images. Yeah, and some images. So oh. just seeking clarity through the Chair, um, you're wanting to see a connection of sorts in this, in this charter, though, linking back to that, those values, yeah. which we can do. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Councillor Foster, um, and then Parata. Um, a lot of times when we're debating, um, we do refer back to pre-health and safety days and, and certain situations, and we bring this up in our debating. Now, if we adopt this, are we contravening this new document by bringing up past health and safety or non-health and safety requirements when we are talking about different issues? Um, I mean, you know, we, we just use examples sometimes of the way things were used to be, the can-do attitude and all that, and now health and safety has hindered some of those things in different ways, and some, some for the better, maybe some for the not, that's up to individuals. But I've, I'm just wanting to know if, if um, we are debating and we're trying to bring back some um, common sense and some different things, um, uh, are we contravening this um, new responsibility that is being put upon us? Through the chair, I'll give you the respond. I yes. think it'll be a case by case basis, and given the context in which we're discussing that, I would encourage councillors um, to be mindful that the new law sure. that's been in place since 2015 has was well the law of the day, and everything that we do in terms of health and safety in the council context is um, reflective of that legislation. Um, but, but no one's going to hold you to account for talking about yesteryear, Councillor Foster, where health and safety is concerned, um, even in very high level conversations around health and safety. I'm about to join a meeting this afternoon. People do talk about the past, um, but we live in the future where health and safety is concerned. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just really wanted to um, thank, thank staff um, for this health and safety policy over the last three or so weeks, we've seen all of our DDC staff, um, lots of community contractors work very hard, work really hard. Um, and to know that the health and safety of our people is paramount is really important. And it's really important that they know that we feel that, that we feel that their, their wellbeing and their safety is important. So I really wanted to um, commend and acknowledge that, that this document has um, been put together um, I also agree um, with councillors about, um, you know, that their cultural and tikanga safety, particularly for our um, our staff and our contractors that um, that walk Fenua Māori um, and 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 on our roads. Um, You'll be better advised by your Māori staff, um, but that um, I think that that does have a space here in terms of keeping people um, spiritually and physically safe. Um, yeah, the one thing I did want to know is that whether or not this policy has a space for how our, how our people, how our contractors, how our staff, are, if they are mistreated by the public what happens because over the last three weeks we've seen this is like we've seen some of our people be very kennel yeah. to our roading staff and um you know be very unkind to our um you know gdc gdc staff trying to do their mahi um is there a space in this policy that can outline you know how we either keep themselves safe or whether or not there's anything we can do to deter people from behaving in that manner I think at a very high level, through the, sorry, through the chair, at a very high level, the policy is designed to cover things like that. But you might have some sub subset guidelines for staff. Um, there are, uh, I know for governors, there's some really good guidelines that are produced from LGNZ around how to keep yourself safe um, as a governor and, and um, practices and stuff in place in terms of staff 
uh, where they're not feeling safe in the community. Um, we've, we've unfortunately had a lot of experience in that regard, and it's just accentuated recently with the events. Um, so we do have staff that do de-escalation training, et cetera, we have those protocols in place. So a lot of our front-facing staff um, allow the library, and you've heard those results come through in terms of h and reporting. So, yeah, I acknowledge what you're saying, and, and perhaps that's something specifically that we could look at at an operational level and ensuring that we've got our... Um, our policy and guidance in place for staff, if that is appropriate. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, have you spoken? No. Well, then you speak now. <laughs> um, so this charter is in relation to health and safety, and health and safety is a very um, legal term um, defined under the Health and Safety Work Act. So looking at um, the charter and looking at the matter raised by Councillor Tupara um, and the decision we've been asked to make today, uh, is, it, is it appropriate that this lay on the table for more work to be done around cultural safety or will cultural safety become part of a health and safety matrix um, that is reported back to us? Because it doesn't seem to be captured in law and it doesn't seem to be captured in the charter. We wish it was just discussing, yeah, and that's fine if you want to let it lie on the table and we can go add um, the amendments that were required, bring it back for adoption, or alternatively can adopt it and then we replace it once we've updated it. We're entirely in your hands here. Yeah. It's a work in progress. Is it fine, bring it back, or you can just take that You moved. Uh, oh. Got two different thoughts on the table. Let's, I, let's hear from Councillor Tibble as well and you know get a few ideas and then we can make that decision. What do you think? Um, I just want to um, battle for Councillor Tupara in this conversation here with Councillor Robinson um, the importance of considering further the depth required for the tikanga and value space. Uh, simply if we reflect back to uh, what happened at Fakari and the eruptions there, what was clear to be seen there and post all of it uh, was the difference between how Māori values and Māori community and Māori worldview approached what the approach could have been differently done. And so because our population is 52% Māori, it's upon us to be thinking about what is the worldview that gets approached in our problems when we're dealing with them, and is that worldview actually quite different from the dominant worldview that's applied to the thinking? And so um, I think it is important that we think about it again, because it would be great to see if our technicians could find where there are other spaces in a desktop literature review about how this could be applied and put into practice. And if there isn't anything uh, at the moment, then what is it upon the tight after to create that? Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm just going to make an executive decision that I think we let it lie on the table. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Rock. This gives staff the opportunity to go mm -hmm. and do a little bit more from the feedback. Next time we have the opportunity to adopt this very important document. Thank you for that. All in favour? Aye. Okay, councillors, we will grab a cover and then. Going to give us a little sneak up, or are you going to do it now and then we have a break? Yeah, we'll go to the meeting. Um, and then we will, I'm just going to ask Councillor Fadehinga to close our meeting with a karakia, and then we will have a little snack and an update. Kia ora mai tato, i te tuatahi. It's tuata i ki ngā tini mate i Wanganui a tātou, a i tēnei rā, a oki oki atu rā ki te rangatira te rā o te karaka, John Coates, moi mai, moi mai, oki oki atu rā i te rangatira ki te whānau pani, a te whānau Coates, a tukunu atu te mihi aroha, tā tātou mihi aroha ki a koutou, ki ngā Hunga e māwiwi ana ki ngā e pani ana e arawakore ana e noho here here ana i tēnei wā tūkuna atu te mihi aroha ki a koutou. Ka mutu, mi noi tātou i te whanu.
Ake atau iho mai nga manaki tanga te wahi nga roki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou ki ngā ki ngā hunga e maui ane e rawa kore ane e pani ane e noho heri heri ana e ake i tēnei wa Ake arangi tāmirohi o tātou mano ki ngā heri o te rongo mau ki ngā tauro te roki hau he rongo take take, he rongo huru mani Hau ngē hui e tāra Thank you.